Welcome into the Odds and Audibles podcast. I'm Matt Prem, Eric Scope with Jared Mack on the show. And Mario Cristobal is officially the head coach of the Miami Hurricanes. He has been announced by the school. Uh, he has commented on it um, Monday morning. This happened uh, right around 8 a.m. Pacific time. Mario Cristobal had a team meeting with the players. Um, Rob Mullins has spoken on it. And we're here now to kind of just pick up the pieces. And this is kind of last 48 hours, right? This is kind of where we were all thinking this was going. I think prior to that, there was more optimism, more expectation that Crystal Ball would stay. But the way things intensified, it feels like over the last 48 to 72 hours, this is the destination we were all going to land on and just – this program, where is it at now? Eric, you said this program was in limbo after the Pac-12 championship game. It, it, do you feel it's taken even a step back in th- from that regard, or is it still in a good place? I think well, it's it's in limbo, but it's actually a step advanced because you know now what is happening, right? right. When we when we talked about that, the, yeah. the, the 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 concept was we don't know who the new head coach is. Well, we know now it's not Mario Cristobal. We know he's not the head coach in 2022. Um, it is a program in limbo in terms of we don't know what the identity of what this program will be. It changes from coach to coach. Obviously, there's there's no reason there shouldn't be optimism. Oregon can field the very competitive roster in 22, and there's no reason you shouldn't believe Oregon can't continue to be one of the best teams in the country and a conference champion contending team with whoever is hired. But right now we are in that we are still in a limbo mode here of well, who's the next coach? And obviously, this podcast we will not accomplish finding that out. That that news will not break during this show. I don't think that would be stunning, considering the conversation we just had with Rob Mullins. Um, I think we'll find something out in this probably by the end of the week. We'll have a pretty good idea, I would guess. Um, at least leading up to signing day, I think that's one thing we have to talk about from a timeline perspective. And and Rob Mullins did acknowledge that that, that kind of real barrier you have there of the signing day period is fast approaching. We're about a week away, and Oregon and we'll get to some of this later. It needs to retain its recruits, its commits, build this class. That's, again, the lifeblood of the program. They need to figure out a lot of things. And and you guys talk about being in limbo. Um, Rob Mm -hmm. Mullins, even on the interview session, pointed out, I don't know who's going with Mario to Miami. Um, That's why they haven't set an interim head coach, because he's trying to make sure you don't say, hey, it's going to be this guy. When that guy goes, well, hey, I'm actually going to follow Mario Cristobal to Miami. Um, so yeah, there's still so much to be answered. Who's coaching the game from an interim head coach perspective. We should note Mike Bellotti has already said he was open to doing so. I think that's kind of notable. We made a joke about that the other day on the pod, um, about that possibility. That would be kind of, there'd be some humor to a Bob Stoops versus Mike Bellotti, uh, bowl game. I think they coached against each other in 2006, the last time these two teams played. Um, so there'd be kind of, that'd be kind of humorous. Um, but yeah, there's so much, so many moving parts that we're probably going to miss some stuff today on this show just because there's a million things going through our heads. There's so many different pieces of this. I think where, where I'm at right now is we're at that first step now, that infancy step of that next relationship. And this next week, these next 10 days, whatever the timeline is to get this decided, um, it, it's going to be huge for the future of this program. You can't miss on this hire. And to me, I, you know, we, I know we'll get into kind of some things that you're looking for in this. For me, longevity is a value here. Um, you think about this program since Bilotti left in 2009. There have been four different coaches, and all of them have lasted four years or fewer. Oregon kind of has a four-year curse there when you think about Chip Kelly and Mark Helfrich and now Mario Cristobal lasting four years. Obviously, Helfrich was, did not leave on his own volition. Um, the other two did. Um, Willie Taggart mixed in. There was a one and done and leaving. So to me, it's go find somebody who's – this is not a stepping stone for and somebody who wants to be here for the long term because this is tough on a program. I think we all feel like the Oregon football program under Mario Cristobal, its best days, hypothetically, if he was still the coach, were ahead of them. Mm-hmm. That is no longer the case. And now you have to rebuild. So to me, it's just like you got to find somebody who's going to be here longer than four years if you help to build anything special. It's hard to build a championship roster in that amount of time. It's not often. You go look at the, the schools that win championships. Most of them have more than that. To get there and if you're oregon i think you owe it to yourself to go find somebody that says hey i'm going to be the head coach here i'm not sure you're going to get a guarantee of it because hey frankly mario cristobal kind of said he was going to be here for the long haul it was one of the things he said in his introductory press conference that you'd have to drag him out kicking and screaming well that didn't play out that way so i didn't have to do that didn't have to do that um so but that's just belaboring the point of 
you got to find somebody who's going to be here for a while. That's kind of where my head my head is at. I mean, it's I, I agree. It'd be nice to have somebody here for a long time, but that's just such a struggle these days, especially in college football. Uh, there's just so much turnover in terms of coaches, as we've seen this year with Mario leaving, Lincoln Riley leaving, Brian Kelly leaving. Um, those guys were all there at their programs. Kelly and Lincoln uh, specifically were there for a good amount of time, especially Brian Kelly. But uh, and then with just how college football is going with the transfer portal, uh, people have options. Yeah. And they this is now a business more than it has ever been. Um, so to find a candidate that's going to stick around for a long time would be ideal. It's just a question of if that person will actually want to stick around for a long time, because it certainly seemed as if Mario Cristobal had wanted to and intended to stick around at Oregon for whatever a long time period is, six, eight years, whatever you want to mark it down as. Oregon was you know, prepared to keep him around for longer than six to eight years. Um, John Canzano of the, of the Oregonian reported that Oregon offered a 10-year, $85 million contract to Mario. And the terms for Mario's deal at Miami are 10 years, 80 million, um, at least $8 million a year. And that's a long time. Um, the, the, just not every coach is Nick Saban and is going to stick around a program for that long. I think coaches only stick around programs for that long with the kind, kind of continued success that Saban has had at Alabama, something like that. Because after a while, you just need a fresh face. You need a new identity. Um, it happens far too often in college football. College basketball is something, something else. Um, but this is going to be a huge hire. This has to be a huge hire for Oregon. And I'm not sure what the route is that they'll go, whether it is somebody who potentially has longevity potential and someone who is um, well-known, established, has been a West Coast person, or if they go after somebody who's new and up-and-coming or somebody who is a little more prolific and, a, and more of a national person rather than a West Coast person. Um, Mullins, uh, his, in his press conference today, just basically talked about how you know they're looking after the student athletes for right now. They're looking for somebody who's going to be a leader of, of young men, um, which is great. That's what it should be. This is, you know, not only is it a coaching opportunity, but it's a leading leadership opportunity for whoever becomes the next coach. Um, this will be an interesting interesting line to develop and to watch out for and to see where where Oregon goes. I'd imagine that, Eric, like you said, by the end of the week, there should be some real idea of who's becoming um, a like, real candidate, like a top three list. But it's just Monday. So this has been quite the morning. Who becomes interim head coach? Um, I asked Rob Mullins that. TV day, uh, TBA, to be announced, um, they don't really know yet. And a part of that is because a lot of the assistant coaches were out on the trail recruiting when this news broke Monday morning. So those guys are flying home to Oregon. Rob Mullins has to meet with those coaches. And more importantly, he needs to figure out who is staying at Oregon, who wants to stay at Oregon, and who's following Mario Cristobal to Miami. I think there are three very obvious assistant coaches that follow. Um, Alex Mirabal, the offensive line coach, uh, he is a longtime friend of Mario Cristobal. They grew up together. I think that is probably the most obvious one. Um, I also think tight end special teams coordinator Bobby Williams um, has been one of Cristobal's mentors, and I, I would expect that Bobby – either retires or follows Mario to Miami to help him build that program. And then Brian McClendon, the receivers coach, I think is probably the least likely of the three that I've just named, but I think he is one that you have to monitor. He has no ties to the West Coast beyond his two years here at Oregon. Hired by Crystal Ball, really good recruiter in the state of Georgia, really good recruiter mm -hmm. in the South. Uh, that makes the most sense. And then I think you should expect Aaron Fell, the strength and conditioning coach, to also follow Mario Cristobal to Miami. His family is from the South. Um, you know, he's, schools have tried to poach him. He has seriously considered it the last couple of seasons. Now he has an opportunity to go home. Makes sense. Who is the interim head coach at Oregon? Um, I Tell me if I'm wrong here, but I, 
I think there are three logical answers on that side of the front. One is Tim DeRuiter. Um, he has served as an interim head coach before. He has also been a head coach, um, Oregon's defensive coordinator. I think Oregon's running game coordinator, running back coach, Jim Mastro, would be another logical choice. Or associate head coach, defensive line coach, Joe Salavea. I think those are the three names you have to look at if you're gonna if you're gonna have an interim head coach, or as uh, we've we've seen pointed out, uh, Mike Bellotti is is available as well. And I, I think you have to, to a degree, consider that. But he's been so far long removed from the program, he has no ties to any of the players, and I think how they would receive him would would dictate where things go. Not that they would be like against him but is it just like hey who is this guy i don't even know who he is like but beyond you know just being a former oregon head coach some of it has to do with who do you think you could you're planning on retaining and who do you want i think you, the person right. you're promoting into that position is someone you hope is still on the staff in 22 so i think some of it comes down to what's the future of that coach at oregon um obviously that doesn't have to be the case like dante williams was the interim head coach at usc and i think there's a pretty decent chance maybe i've missed something that he is not on lincoln riley staff at USC. So sometimes it doesn't have to be that case, but um, I, I would imagine that if there is a sense that either DeRuiter, Mastro, or Salavea is going to leave, whether that is to follow Mario Cristobal or, or for their own job, I mean, Jim Mastro could be a candidate for some head coaching positions. Um, Tim DeRuiter maybe as well. I mean, who knows? Um, but if, if there's a sense that you, any of those guys are, are, are not long for the job, it doesn't make sense to put them in that position. Um, and I also think you do want to be somewhat co careful and cognizant of, of if you intend to retain some of those coaches, the hurt feelings you might have of being overlooked. Um, I know that in the past that has been something that that will bite schools where you say, okay, we're going to give the interim tag to this coach. Well, the other coach says, well, I've been here longer. I've yeah. been in a position of control and power in the past. So why, why are you giving it to somebody who was hired more recently? Totally hypothetical, but like, is Joe Salavea frustrated if Tim Truder is the interim head coach, considering Salavea here has been every step of the way with Mario and Truder was just hired? This is all hypothetical. I'm just putting that out there in terms of adding that to the discussion of, I think, some of the, uh, I guess, dynamics socially have to go into consideration in terms of, of who you want it to be, which is why, like, if you're trying not to hurt feelings quite as much, maybe you do consider, like, a Mike Bellotti because it is a person who – you're not feeling like it's you're choosing between assistants. You're saying we're going with this person kind of while I figure things out. I, 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 that's all hypothetical. I'm not sourcing any of that. Just kind of my brain processing the information I have right now. Um, you got to be careful if you're Rob Mullins, I think, with attaching that. And I do think, aside from the fact that you have to wait and see who actually comes back, I, I think that's maybe part of the reason why there hasn't been a, a finalized decision here is just kind of seeing what this, how this works out over the next 24, 48 hours. I imagine we'll have an answer relatively shortly on, on who the interim head coach is like in fact i wouldn't be surprised if we find that information out before the next time we record a podcast i'd agree i, I don't think it'll take too long i don't no. really think that the interim tag is going to ruffle any feathers no. uh it's just the interim tag i i don't anticipate whoever takes over the interim position for the next game is going to become an, even a head coach candidate uh i don't i, I wouldn't see oregon like I think the interim is going to ultimately end up being Tim DeRuiter. Um, he just has head coaching experience, like Matt right. has said. Um, but I don't think Oregon would really consider him to become the head coach of the football team after that. So I think they would like to retain him as defensive coordinator. I think he's done a solid job this year, considering all the injuries that his entire linebacking core and most of his safeties have, you know, undertaken. But um yeah, it's, it's all about who's staying and who's going. And the fact that Rob Mullins didn't know who was staying and who's going means I'm not sure that Mario Cristobal knows who's staying and who's going. Because um, I would I would almost anticipate that you know, Mario's smart enough as a football coach to, to have an idea of who he wants to come and go with him into Miami. But it doesn't sound like he ha he knows exactly who's going with him. And that's just me going off the top of my head. Um, and I, I, you know, I think there's an obvious one with coach Alex Mirabal. I think he's obviously going to go down with Mario to Miami, um, and help him develop an offensive line there, just like he did at Oregon. But I think it'll be, um, I think it'll be a bit of a surprise who goes and who stays. 
Um, I think Oregon would, would really like most of the staff to go intact other than if they were to pursue other head coaching opportunities like Jim Mastro and Nevada, if Nevada's coach goes and gets hired. Um, I think it'll just be some more, um, it'll just be interesting to see who goes and who stays. I think it's going to be really important to see um, how Oregon goes and replaces those candidates. And they have to wait until they hire their head coach to see who he wants to replace those candidates. Um, it's just a lot of moving parts. It's like how we uh, opened this entire podcast to talking about how the team and the program right now is in a bit of limbo. And this is, this is the epitome of that is they're, all waiting on one hire and then all the next hires are waiting on that, all the recruits, all the commits. It's going to be quite an interesting two weeks, especially with signing day around the corner. Eric, you, you went to the HTC this morning, Monday morning. Um, tough. I, I'm sure it was tough to get anyone to talk, but just describe the, the scene for people here on the podcast of what you observed, because we've done this before and, and it's, it's, it's awkward, it's tough, and it's difficult to explain. Yeah. No, uh, nobody wanted to talk on or off record. I approached and had several in exchanges with numerous football players, and they were all positive exchanges, but all resulted in, yeah, I don't feel like I want to talk right now. And, and you could sense, unsurprisingly, that they were frustrated and disappointed. I mean, I, maybe frustrated is me. That's probably my own word there. But the, you could sense that this was tough, and this was not ideal. And um, you could see the sense of finality of the Mario Cristobal era on their faces. And I think, you know, we, we as media and those listening as fans have been emotionally through the ringer with this. But imagine what it's like to be a football player on the team and to have a connection, right? It's one thing to say, I'm a fan of this school, but those players have a relationship with Mario Cristobal. He brought almost every single one of them here. He was instrumental in development for, for a lot of them. You know, think about some of the offensive linemen how integral he's been. And this is now a personal loss as much as it is for those listening and for us for covering this team as a, um, you know, coaching loss. So uh, that part I think came across pretty clearly. It was, you know, I thought it was kind of perfect that it was raining. It's an ugly, gloomy morning. You know, everybody had their hoods up because of it. And it was a lot of kind of sad Charlie Brown walks, if you will. Of just you could tell everybody was just kind of feeling it and it wasn't good. And um, I wish I had a couple of players who were willing to say some words, but I totally understand the circumstances. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very understandable that that's where everybody's at. And I think one of the things we now have to kind of reckon with is who goes with Mario from a transfer perspective. The portal has yeah. shifted things so significantly where it used to be a head coach is leaving. And, well, do you want to do that? You might have to, you might get a waiver. You might not get a waiver. Most of these guys will be able to transfer and play at Miami if they will choose to immediately. And that makes the ease of this whole thing, it, it improves it so much. So I, I don't know. I think, I think that's the thing we need to talk about a little bit too here is, is not specifically who's going to go and, and making some guesses on that or, you know, educated thoughts on, okay, this person was recruited by so-and-so, but just to point out, this is going to have, we talked about Oregon losing assistant coaches to Miami, Oregon could lose players to Miami, Oregon will undoubtedly lose recruits, maybe not specifically to Miami, but will not sign several players. There are going to be players that choose to wait. Um, I will also say, I thought it was notable. Rob Mullen said that Mario Cristobal told the team, you guys committed to Oregon, not to me. It was clearly an intent of, letting players know that this is, program is still going to be okay on his way out. Um, I thought that was sort of notable. Um, but, yeah, this is this is tough. And I think just being around the players and building relationships with them, it, this, was, this was kind of hard for me to take in, too, of just you could see how much everything has meant to them and how much is lost. And even as an outsider kind of seeing that, you're, you're kind of impacted by it. I will say that for the transfer portal – it can go both ways where I, I firmly believe that Oregon's going to lose players through the portal to Miami. It's just how it kind of goes nowadays. And yeah, the, the players commit to the team, but obviously the coaching staff has a lot to do with them committing to the team and the university as a whole. Um, but a rebuild, if, if that's what we want to call this, and I, uh, you know, I just don't have I'd be, a better I'd be, word. Uh, I'd be I just don't have a better word. 
Yeah, yeah I just don't have a better word. Remodel, sure. Um, Oregon fans won't like me saying this, but take a page out of the Oregon State book. Hit, Hit the, the transfer portal. portal hard and get uh, get established talent. Because right now there's a whole lot of that in the transfer portal. Um, Oregon is still a preferred destination for a lot of kids. Uh, obviously, the hire that they make is going to be hugely important in terms of who they can get and who wants to come out west. But this has been this is a different age of college football, and with the portal, you can reload, you can retool, and that's what Oregon will need to do because obviously they're going to lose players to the draft, hundred percent. I think Oregon would probably was probably already planning on hitting the portal hard this off season, just from transfers and. Um, players going to the draft, blah, blah, blah. I, I think now it becomes more prevalent than ever. And with with losing commits and losing players to the draft, to the portal, um, this is an opportunity to re retool, reload, get some new faces in here, uh, not just on the coaching staff. And as the season or as the offseason progresses, there's going to be even more talent that jumps in. Um, so this, this won't be as... I can't imagine it's going to be a full-on rebuild. It's just going to be a retooling. It's a reloading. Um, and I think you should look at how Oregon State has retooled and reloaded and gone to, you know, a, their, their bowl game this year. And I, they were in contention for the Pac-12 North. That's a football team just a few years ago. That was embarrassing to watch. And so I'm not saying that Oregon will get stooped to that level, but – uh, I think they they have the opportunity now with how college football is to take advantage and get some new players and some talent coming in as soon as next year. Where they turn, um, we'll have more on coaching candidates here in a little bit um, on another podcast. We'll have stuff up on DuckTerritory.com. We've been waiting to release our hot board based off of conversations with Rob Mullins. We wanted to get just his parameters, his thinking, his his mindset before we released our, our list. But they're going to have to go big. They're going to have to to, to to find a coach that can continue this program. And, and Rob said that his phone has been blowing up and that there will be cranking up the search. Um, they will be leaning on, I think, lots of people to make this hire. First and foremost – he said internally they'll have a lot of uh, help within the system. It's not just going to be him. Uh, he then said that they will lean on their supporters of the program, um, a.k.a. that's code for boosters, that's code for Phil Knight and other big players. Uh, he referenced people outside the program that support this team, have backgrounds in sports and business uh, and, and all other qualities that they'll need for this hiring process. Uh, and then he also confirmed that, uh, they will go, be going back to Parker Executive Search Firm. Um, this is a, a company that has aided Oregon in the past. Um, I believe they helped with Willie Taggart, and I also believe that they helped with Mario Cristobal. Um, so this is no, a normal pro practice for them. So it's going to be a little bit of everything um, in terms of where they lean on help to make this coaching higher. Now, I think we're all in agreement, right? Let's end it with this one, this, this discussion talking point. Um, there's going to be transfers. There's going to be decommitments. Mm -hmm. And this process needs to be handled as quickly as they possibly can, but at the same time to make sure that they make the correct hire. You cannot fumble this and hire – make a hire really quickly to, to, to save the recruiting class and then it fall out, you know, year two, year three, year four. So you need to find the right guy, but you need to do it as quickly as you can. And that makes this entire thing very stressful. The balance is really a tough, the tightrope walk for Rob Mullins. I think um, just a couple of thoughts here of do, how much do you want to prioritize retainment of these recruits like what how high is that on the priority list or as jared suggested do you figure hey if we lose some guys we'll hit the portal hard and we'll figure it out because oregon historically has looked at internal candidates and promoted from within i don't think that will happen um i would also point that that has not always worked out 
I think that Mark Helfrich example is a perfect one of that felt convenient at the time. They obviously maintained success for a couple of years, but as Matt said, it was pretty clear year three into year four, or maybe just year four, but it, not, not going well. Now, this is, this is not, not the long-term fit. So I think it's a balance of that of, okay, do you want to promote somebody from within and try to, I mean, I, I don't think they're even really going to really widely consider that, but if you decided to promote from within, I think you run the risk of really making a mistake. Um, I think the other part here is, do you look at coaches that are coaching in big bowl games? Like, and that maybe aren't going to leave. You try to push for something like that. No, I don't think you can because this timeline here, you don't want to wait till January. Nope. I think that's a really, really tough line to walk. Um, if you're waiting on NFL coaches that might lose their jobs or whatnot, you're also waiting a very long time. So the, the what I'm getting at is the pool of candidates is kind of whatever the pool of candidates is right now. Unless you have 100% confidence that you are getting a name coach that will blow everybody's socks off and you feel like you can make that higher in January and have enough time from January to February to figure out your recruiting class. I don't know if that's feasible. Um, I will also say there are some coaches in the Pac-12 that I think you might want to look at with ties. Um, there's a coach at Cal who played at Oregon. There's a coach at Oregon State who's certainly Im impressing those around him. Um, I don't know if any of those are feasible. I don't know what Oregon's interest level is in those candidates. Those would be convenient and, for my money, would provide you longevity because I don't look at either of those coaches because they both have ties to the state as being ones that would necessarily ever look to take off. Um, so that's part of the balance, too. Personally, I'd love to take a look at someone who's an up-and-coming coach but does have ties to the West Coast. I think you have to be very careful, for my money, of repeating the same mistake you just made two times in a row with hiring a big time potential coach from the Southeast whose dream job is never going to be Oregon and who is going to mm -hmm. be very interested in taking off. Um, so I think there's a lot of parts to juggle here. I don't know who the perfect candidate is. I don't think Rob Mullins frankly knows who the perfect candidate is right now. Um, but I do think there's going to be a lot of things to chew on. And I think from a timeline perspective, if this isn't wrapped up before national signing day, that leads me to believe that maybe they are waiting perhaps on somebody who's still coaching either in the NFL or still coaching in college football at a high level. I don't even think any of the, I mean, I guess the only real one in the college football playoff conversation to consider is Luke fickle that you would think could even feasibly leave. The other ones aren't moving. Um, if you think you have a shot with him, maybe you wait. I don't know. Um, this is a tough balance. And again, the more time that comes off the clock to use the sports metaphor, the more time you lose ground on the recruiting aspect and to me, it comes down like how much of a priority is that and how much are they willing to give up there to maybe wait it out? Or, or do they feel like, hey, we got to act really fast because we've got some talented players. We want to make sure we are able to retain. And the same thing in terms of retaining players from the current roster. Who's the first person you guys call? Matt, what do you think? Who you, who's your first if you're, call? If you're Rob. If you're Rob Mullins. Athletic director, Rob Matt Mullins, the first person. I think the first person I call is Dave Miranda at Baylor. Um, yes, sir. He's from the West Coast, and he's a defensive-minded coach. He's one big at Baylor. I just fear that you know, he, he's probably in a good spot with the Baylor Bears. Um, so that's probably the first name I would call, but I don't think it's a realistic scenario that he comes. Um, I – yeah, you guys say your two, and then I'll I'll pivot to the next part. I kind of really like Lane Kiffin hypothetically, um, <laughs> but I think it's mostly hypothetical. He yes. did just re up with Ole Miss. Um, he is such a polarizing candidate. So it's funny because, like, you know, last couple of days been chatting with folks, mostly just buddies of mine that are Oregon fans, and bringing his name up either <laughs> warranted a "no way, what the hell are you talking about" sort of response or a "ooh." That's intriguing. Um, mm -hmm. He has also, if I'm talking longevity, there's some concerns there. If you look at his coaching career 
um, a couple of t- making some jumps here and there. Um, I, I really just think or- or Oregon can't be a, a- another uh, stepping stone for a coach like that. I- and I know Matt or uh, Jared, you brought up the fact that that's what happens in college football. I understand that. Um, I just think it's there, there, there is value in trying to get somebody here who's going to be here for six years to actually build something. Um, and so uh, that doesn't mean you don't take a swing because you could accomplish a lot in two to three years. Um, we've seen that happen with two coaches in the last decade or so with Chip Kelly and with Mario Cristobal. You took a swing on both of those guys, so, so to speak. Both of them were internal candidates. Um, and they both gave you four really good years. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm probably more prone to considering somebody who's more likely to stick around for six to eight years than I am to say, all right, let's go hire a flashy guy who we think is going to give us two and bounce. I mean, obviously you'd like the guy to stay, but I just don't think that happens anymore. It just doesn't. Um, I, I don't really look at Oregon as a stepping stone because I don't think they're any different than like three schools that aren't stepping stones. That's the issue. I mean, Brian Kelly went from Notre Dame to LSU. Notre Dame is one of the most storied, if not the most storied program in college football how, history. How, how long was Brian at Notre Dame for that, though? Uh, he was there for a while. Like I don't know de- off the top de- of my head. I'll, I'll, I mean, I don't mind if the coach ends up taking off for LSU after a decade. I just if, – sure. if it's, if it's going to be – you're going to he get was there for to, 11 years. Yeah, if you're going to get 2 to 4 years, like shoot, I would take I think Lincoln Riley gave Oklahoma 6. Like that's that's acceptable to me. I just I just think that if this is a repeat where you're having to replace and replenish this entire program four, four. Five, four. Okay. Well, so but re, so maybe 4 is not the number I'm looking at, but like I, I would pr- much prefer to have a coach that's going to at least give you some time and and then if he takes off, he takes of off. Course. I understand that. I just, I just think if this is another three to four years, what, what are you building at this point? And I, and I understand that the, the, that the culture and the, and the landscape shifts like that. I also would say that there are coaches that stick around for a while at, at schools and that aren't poached frequently, um, you know. And and I would just like to see Oregon find their long term guy. Give me where where's Oregon's Urban Meyer or uh, even a Jim Harbaugh, you know, somebody like that who's just going to stick it out. Well, Urban. but I'm, I'm <laughs> Urban jumped around all the time. But when he was at Ohio State, he stuck it out for a while until obviously he didn't. I'm just saying, like you, I, I don't want. And, and, I and, and I also say he didn't jump from Ohio State to another school. He retired at that time, right? So my, my point is yeah, just I, th- 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 this is feeling more and more like a job that people just they'll give it a couple of years and then they're gone. And I, I think if that continues to feel like the trend, which is what it already is nationally, I don't, that's really I'm concerned by that personally. I just think it's a national trend, and. To, to answer my question from so long ago, my first call is Dave Aranda. I'm going right to Baylor. You know what Baylor is? Sorry, Baylor fans. Baylor, Baylor is a stepping stone school. Right. So I'm, if, if, if the Oregon offer reported by John Canzano was true, where it's 10 years, $85 million, um, I think that offer can get you on the line with almost any coach in the country. And I don't think Oregon would spend that much on Aranda because he's not necessarily proven that he's worth it. Although, you know, Michigan State gave 1090 to uh, Mel Tucker, even though he's only had one good year. So maybe maybe Aranda is worth it. But he's someone that I could see, you know, falling into that category, Eric, of staying around for a bit. Um, he was Wisconsin's defensive coordinator for four years. He was LSU's defensive coordinator for five. Just hired by Baylor. This is his second year in the program. He turned, went from... Two and seven last year to eleven and two this year. Um, I think he's the first call. I think he's somebody who West Coast native like Matt represent went to Cal Lutheran. Um, you know, had tutelage under Mike Leach at Texas Tech as a GA. Um, he's he's good. I like his temperament, his mentality, his hires so far have done well. Jeff Grimes is their offense coordinator at Baylor. That's a. I think that'd be a great hire. It just depends if that's realistic or not, and. Who knows at this point? Uh, it's still very early. I don't think they'll do any internal c- promotions. I don't think there's somebody on the staff after Moore had left that would really be a suitable candidate to replace Cristobal as a head coach. Um, and as far as other Pac-12 coaches, I unless I'm calling Lincoln, I'm good. You're not calling Chip Kelly? I, this, this narrative that Chip Kelly needs to return to Oregon, I, I hate it. <laughs> like... Jim Kelly, 
was transcendent at Oregon. He was the first guy to do the spread offense. He was the first guy to just score points at will. He was a great coach. He put Oregon on the map, blah, 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 blah. That's not, that's not Chip Kelly anymore. Yeah, was, that's, that's what I there's, was going to say. There's no team in the country that doesn't, except for like Army, but yeah, but there's no team in the country that doesn't run a spread offense anymore. What he did that was so revolutionary and obviously has made the game of college football so much more fun is standard. It's standard practice now. And Kelly has gone down to, to, to UCLA and they had a good year this year, but that's finally they had a good year. There's still the part of him that doesn't recruit. There's still the part of him that doesn't know how to run a defense every once in a while. I just, we, you can't keep living in the past as an Oregon fan. You have to continue to move forward and getting Chip Kelly of the past isn't happening this time around. You know, that's eight, 10 years ago. It's different nowadays. And I don't think, I think taking a chance on Chip Kelly would be a step backwards. So I'm out on that Chip Kelly narrative. I think it's silly. Um, you will not see me promoting it anytime soon. If you hire Chip Kelly, and look, I, I think the discussion needs to be made because I'm not in, I'm not saying this is the home run hire. I'm not saying this is um, a lock to, to be successful, but I do think they have to consider it because it is the only off. And I think it's the only name aside from Dave Aranda and any kind of top 10 previously established head coach. I think this is maybe the only name that you know, probably universally across the board in the country, everyone would say, would see this higher and go, Oh, that's interesting. That's, that's going to be fun. That's, Oh, they're getting the band back together again. Four straight Pac-12 champion or four, four straight BCS bowls with Chip Kelly. Here we go. Sign me up. Recruits will, will love it because what do we hear the most about Oregon and recruits when they talk about, oh, I've loved Oregon ever since D'Anthony Thomas. Oh, I've loved Oregon ever since Marcus Mariota. Oh, I've loved Oregon uh, and, and their fancy uniforms and their flashy offenses and the spread offense and how they go, 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 go. I mean, David Pollock, and we can we can joke all we want about his lack of, of information on Oregon. And a lot of the other big talking heads on ESPN, when they reference – they don't look like the organ of old. That is a direct comparison to Chip Kelly. And I, I think he is the only name that the recruits would instantly go, oh, my God, this is awesome. Sign me up. The fan base would, for the most part, I think, would be, here we go. Awesome. Chip Kelly. The boosters would probably love it. And the national media would certainly be all over it. I don't. I'm not saying it's the right hire because, like Jared said, it, are you hiring the 46 and 17 Chip Kelly, Oregon head coach, or are you hiring the 18 and 25 UCLA head coach? Because if it's if it's the what he did at Oregon and that's the biggest draw, the the landscape, as Jared pointed out, of college football has changed since then. Everyone knows how to defend that. And so you need to look at UCLA, Chip Kelly, and say there's something in that 18 and 25 period. Eight and four this year, second in the South. They blew out UCLA, or they blew out USC. They beat LSU. They played Oregon tough. They're playing in the Holiday Bowl. Something about that, Chip Kelly, is why we're hiring him. And everything else prior to Oregon, uh, pr prior to his time at Oregon, is just a, a gravy on the boat type situation here. Um so I, I think that's one that you have to consider because it, it will move the needle. But is it the right move to make long term? I don't know. Um, I also think internally you have to think long and hard about Justin Wilcox because that fits the, the narrative that Eric was talking about of it needs to be a guy that's going to be here for the long haul. But I have concerns with Justin Wilcox as well. He's never really seemed to have – a really good offense um, in his time as head coach at Cal. He has been a very good defensive coach, though. Their teams have been very tough to score on. But what's his recruiting like? Is he going to be able to elevate himself to what's required here at Oregon to recruit at a high level? 
how much of the inability to sign elite recruiting classes is in part because of Cal's academic requirements to get into school there, the lack of financial support there, the lack of facilities there, and just simply coming to Oregon, does that fix all of that? I, I, I don't know, and this is, this is probably where I'm going with this last, is this is probably what makes this so frustrating for Rob Mullins, for everyone else inside the athletic department, and for its bigger boosters that are heavily invested into this program and will have to be heavily invested moving forward to hire the new head coach is it doesn't seem like there is a slam dunk hire to be had. Because I truly think if this had played out the way it, it did a couple weeks ago and we in, in the 10 million, uh, the 10 year, $85 million dollar offer to, to, to Marta Cristobal is correct by John Canzano. Who's to say you couldn't have you couldn't have been to school to get Lincoln Riley to come from Oklahoma to, to your place instead of Oklahoma or instead of USC? A lot of those big splashy hires have been have already happened, and I don't know if another one's going to fall. You're going to have to try, but the options don't feel like a hundred percent. This is the one guy you have to go for. Uh, boy, I think it's tough. Um... If I mean honestly, if if you I don't want to say settle, but if you feel like Justin Wilcox or Chip Kelly, if that's who you want, you get that deal done like tomorrow, and you and you and you go out and you try to retain as much of your class. If if, if you're just writing off the possibility of the big names, which I don't think you should do, and I would imagine this has been in the works now for three or four days. I don't think Rob Mullins has been sitting idly by waiting. I would hope there have been already some yeah. reaching out to a variety of candidates that would reach that slam dunk higher caliber, right? That, that would, that would sort of perk and peak interest from fans. Um, like Jared, I'm probably not super excited by the whole Chip Kelly thing, just because of the most recent success. Um, I think it would probably feel really cool for a while. And yeah. then it's possible that it would kind of taint everything, which I actually would hate. Cause for me, the Chip Kelly era was such a special time for Oregon athletics. And I would hate for him to come back and then it doesn't work at all. And now you kind of look at the whole thing a little different. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. you ever, like, it's just a really silly example. Like the TV show Arrested Development was my very favorite comedy show when I was growing up in high school. Well, they tried to reboot it on Netflix and it kind of sucked. And now I kind of have a little different opinion of Arrested Development overall. And I just have a little fear of like, you bring back Chip Kelly thinking it's going to be, you know, 2012, 13, whatever, Chip Kelly. It's not. And it's not. It's such a, it's, I don't know. It's just such a silly narrative. Like Matt, you were saying like, oh, you hire, you would hire him for like, oh, the recruits would like it. The fans would like it. It'd give a, a national news, all of that. You want to know what school did that last time with Chip Kelly? UCLA hasn't gotten him anywhere. And I think that would be the same exact thing at Oregon if they, if they went out and got Chip Kelly again. I just think it's such a silly idea. It's too easy. It's, it's not something difficult. You can't, when you're Oregon, you're in at this point, you cannot just make the easy hire. You have to actually do your due diligence and go find somebody who can actually help the program and not just say, uh, we'll take Chip again. We'll take Justin Wilcox, whatever the case may be. Oregon has to do their due diligence and go after somebody who's going to progress this program going forward. Because they've gone down this rabbit hole, let's just do it just for one more minute. Okay. Sure. Urban Meyer. No. No? no, terrible human. <laughs> Great football coach, terrible human. Yeah, I think uh, I think I have a hard one with with Urban Meyer. Um, but boy, could you win some football games? Yep, you're not wrong. You just have to deal with all the baggage, which is yeah. never worth it. Which is you need like uh, you need like five bellboys to carry all that stuff with him around, all that baggage he's got. Yeah, no, thank you, Lane Kiffin. I already Absolutely. said that. That was my name. I'm I'm I'm. I'm on the lane train. If, if, if you have an understanding with him that, uh, that he's going to keep his act together, yeah. which has always been kind of an issue. I, I think he's really fun though. I actually, and I, and from a, he's been my selfish, second call from, from a, from a selfish yeah, covering yeah. the team perspective, like that could be, be fun. Of, that could be fun yeah. to have one Kiffin as your head coach. <laughs> Chris Just Peterson. Oh yeah. hundred uh, percent. I would love to take a look at Chris Peterson. That would be very interesting. If he wants to coach, come do it for Oregon. I'm in. Has to Ryan Harson. No. Mm. I don't think no. that works. He wants the job. Auburn wants him to have the job. 
so they don't have to fire him. <laughs> right. <laughs> Makes sense why he wants the job then. Yes. Yes. Uh, what, what about uh, what about Cliff Kingsbury? His name uh, Cliff. Cliff's not Trump. leaving, man. He's not leaving. Uh, if it's if it's possible, it's checking some boxes. Um, I don't think he's a good I, coach either. Yeah, and I'm not. Up. I'm not super high on him. Um, I also would say it would be from my longevity perspective, maybe a good thing that he's leaving an NFL job to come to Oregon because maybe that persuades him to not do the same thing later. Maybe, but I don't think he's leaving an NFL job. They're nine and two right now. And, I don't really. I don't but really either. I don't think he's a good coach in general. I always haven't. I don't think he was good at tech. He's just always been blessed with a really good quarterback, and that's just. Kind of what happens when you're a coach and you get Kyler Murray and stuff like that. So last one, last one here. Do you it's it's raining right now? Do we want to row the boat? PJ Fleck? No. Get out of here. Yeah, I'm okay. I'll I'm good. You. Thank you though. Yeah, I don't I don't want that one either. I, I, I'm and just so people don't read into this, I, I'm just naming off names. Uh some of them will be on the hot board, some of them will not be on the hot board, but I think these are names that people will at least bring up um, as fans of, hey, let's go hire this guy type of a discussion. So I wanted do us you, to. Sorry. Do you guys think it's possible Oregon makes a call to Cincinnati? Well, I, I, they, thought, I don't think live. he comes. I don't think it's realistic. I don't think he leaves, but I think you make a call. I, sure, I, 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 I brought that up earlier. That would be the one candidate that I would be willing to. Because he's not leaving. Before they play in the semifinals, point blank. So yeah. if if, no. if 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 you're if you if you're gonna make a call and you get some sort of like if if this drags on, like I would hope that that would be the reason of like okay, we're getting Luke Fickle. But yeah, I don't know if that's possible. He's in pretty good yeah, spot, just, especially with them going to the Big Twelve soon. Like that expedites the process of them continuing to be like very competitive for a while and, and competing for big things. I think this all just points to the fact that um, the early signing period is a great idea, but it the early signing period is a great idea, but it needs to be moved to before the season starts, or just not at all because yeah, it's too close to the coaching carousel. Yes, and it is, it, and it creates too much of chaos for current players for recruits and for coaches and so much of this could be avoided if there was a signing period in in august and you locked yourself in and at the end of the year a a coaching change happens and you can get out of your national letter of intent you can then take your visits and sign in february or there's just is no signing you know there's no early signing period at all and Mm -hmm. this coaching carousel happens you get a couple weeks after the season's over to kind of figure out what you're going to do. And then in January, you take all your visits. Can I, oh, we're just continuing this. And I, this is a, such an aside, but my, my brain says, just d- screw signing periods. Let the kids sign whenever they want to sign. If a kid decides in the middle of the season, he's going to sign, let them sign then. And, and then have the opportunity to have them back out of it with obviously with cause mm-hmm. at, at any time. So like if a kid wants to commit and sign on, a, on an official visit in October, okay, he just signed his letter. He's locked in. If a kid is going to sign in February, he's going to sign in February. But get, just provide, provide even more flexibility. I don't know. That's just an off-the-cuff thing, and we probably should get off this podcast to go do more work because we talked about doing 30 minutes and we've done 50. But that's the way it goes here, and I think this has been fun. Yep. Yeah, it's been, a great, it's been a great couple of days. Um, <laughs> it's going to be crazier. And gosh darn it, I did it again. Gosh dang it. Uh, failed to mention – We've got that 50% off promotion right now. And I'll tell you what, we are approaching 100 new subscribers in the last couple of days. So I can tell you right now, there's information on the board that people are excited about and are finding out about. Don't miss out on that opportunity. Subscribe today to DuckTerritory.com. Get 50% off your membership by doing that. Uh, We will be on the podcast it, it might be a, a daily thing. We don't know yet, you know, I but so. I guarantee you there'll be one soon giving you the updates on what's to come, what's happened, and what we think of it. Uh, up until then, you've been listening to the Odds and Audibles podcast. Talk to you later, folks.